Fantastic. Please do grab a seat. And why don't we pray together? Let's pray. Let's bow our heads. Heavenly Father, we've just been singing that we want to lift up our eyes, and that's our desire. We want to lift our eyes now. We pray you'd help us in our sleepiness, in our tiredness, in our lack of concentration, maybe after all the things that have been happening today. We pray that we'd focus now, that you'd teach us amazing things from your word. Please speak, we pray. Speak with that voice that raises the dead for the glory of Jesus. Amen. Awesome. Well, can you have John 11 open in front of you? We're going to get to John 11 in a little bit. And um, can you grab your books, turn to uh, Big Teach 2. And uh, my experience, uh, Contagious, is that it does really help if you scribble some notes down. Um, Or if you don't like scribbling notes, draw a picture. But but not, not just a picture of anything, but a picture of what I'm talking about. Okay? It will help you to concentrate. If you haven't got a pen, I have one here which I'm willing to donate to the first person who asks me for it. Does anyone need a pen? I'm worried about all the people who live in the way. Awesome. Right. I want to tell you the best, my favourite prayer in the whole Bible. There was a bloke who prayed a prayer that I think is a fantastic prayer that I want us to learn to pray. His, his name was Moses. And Moses was the leader of God's people. And Moses had this amazing experience. He went up on a mountain and he prayed. And this is what he prayed. Now show me your glory. That's it. Five words. Moses went up on a mountain and he said to God, show me your glory. Now show me your glory. And I want to ask you tonight, have you seen the glory of God? I'm not asking, do you know about the glory of God? Moses didn't go up on the mountain and say to God, God, please could I know some more about your glory? He says, God, I want to see it. I want to see your glory. And that's the question for us tonight. I want us tonight to come face to face with the glory of God. Let me give you a silly example that might help you to get this into your head. Um, one of my kids when they were very little when he was about two he was massively into Thomas Tank Engine anyone else? Thomas Tank Engine fans here? yeah okay well he was a big fan of the, the uh, Fat Controller as uh, you know as most boys you know he's a cool Fat Controller he was in charge of all the engines cool but he's not called the Fat Controller anymore by the way he's called Sir Topham Hat which I presume is because to call people fat is rude <laughs> But anyway, uh, he, he loved the fact, he knew lots about the fat controller. He saw him, he, he loved the little pictures of him. He loved, he had a little model of him. He loved it. The fat controller, awesome. One day, we took our kids to um, a Thomas the Tank Engine like place. And the most extraordinary thing happened the fat controller was there. Now, I don't want to be rude, but he was fat. <laughs> I mean, he was an enormous bloke. And he was really tall. And he had this big top hat on as well. And my two-year-old went up to him. And he stood there and went... (laughs) And he looked so small. My little boy looked so small. Because suddenly he saw the glory... He saw the fat controller in all his fat glory. You see, up until that point, he, he knew about the fat controller. He could answer questions about But suddenly he saw him. And it made him feel very small. Now, to see the glory of God is to see God in all all his majesty, the the glorious creator of all things, to see him in his majesty. That is what John 11 is about. Let me just show you that. Turn towards the end of the story in verse 40, sentence number 40. Look Look at what Jesus says. In verse 40 he says, Did I not tell you 
that if you believed, you would see the glory of God. Jesus says to the people at this time, in this story, did I not, you were going to see the glory of God. And that is why this story is here tonight, so that we can see the glory of God. Now, hang on a second, what is God's glory? What does that mean? It's kind of one of those churchy words, oh, glory, what does it mean? What does the word glory mean? Glory is a cool word. Glory means when God is on display. Look, imagine I, um, imagine I invited you to a firework display. I said, I'd like you to come to my house. I've, I'm going to put on a firework display for you. And you all come round to my house, and you're very excited because you love fireworks. And I bring out, I take you into my front room, which is odd. Yeah? He said, what are you doing? I said, well, the display is in here. You're suspicious. You think this is not normal. And you walk in, and on the table, there is a massive display of fireworks. (laughs) In all their cardboard cheesiness. You'd be disappointed, right? You'd say, no, that's not a display of the fireworks. A A firework display is when, boom, you see them. That's the glory of God. When, bang, you see who he really is. When you see him in all his beauty and majesty, that's the glory. God on display. But, you know, the glory of God, I have to warn you, it's a tough thing for humans to handle. In fact, you remember Moses up his little mountain saying to God, now show me your glory. Do you know what God said to him? God said, okay, Moses, I'm going to give you a glimpse of my glory, but I've got to warn you, You can't see it full on. You can't see it full on because if you see my glory fully, you will die. So what God did was he he put him in in a rock, in, in in a cave in the rocks, and he put his hand over the rock, and then God passed by, and as he passed by, Moses was allowed to see the back of him because the glory of God is so magnificently splendid. That Moses could only see a little glimpse. There was another point when the glory of God came. They built this tent called the tabernacle, right? And and God's glory came and it filled the temple, filled this tabernacle, this tent. It was filled with the glory of God, the God on display. And you know what? No one could go in. Because the glory of God was too dangerous for human beings to handle. And so this glory of God thing, it's like, I want to see it, but... You can't see it in the Bible. It's like it's, it's too dangerous. But now, keep your finger in John 11 and go back to the start of John. John chapter 1. I, I really want you, to see, I want you to see what an extraordinary thing the glory of God is for us tonight. Right, John chapter 1, very start of this gospel. This is, John was one of Jesus' friends, one of his disciples. He spent three years with Jesus. He writes down his eyewitness account for us. Look look what he says in verse 14. John chapter 1, verse 14. The word became flesh. That's Jesus. Jesus, the word became flesh. He became a man. He made his dwelling among us. We have seen his glory. The glory of the one and only. So what Moses could only glimpse, what the people couldn't go near, in Jesus, boom, here it is glory of God. We can now see the glory of God as we look at Jesus. And as you go through John's gospel, he's saying, here's the glory of God. Here's the glory of God. So flick over one page in John's gospel. If if your Bible's like mine. Or if it's not, turn to chapter 2. John chapter 2. In John chapter 2, Jesus is at a wedding, there's no wine, Uh, they run out of wine, so Jesus changes water into wine, and look what it says at the end, verse 11, this, the first of his miraculous signs, Jesus performed at Cana in Galilee, he thus revealed his glory, and his disciples put their faith in him. And John gives us seven signs of his glory, revelations of his glory. It's like a firework display. Jesus turns water into wine. 
boom, Jesus raises an official son. Boom, Jesus heals a man at the pool of Beth- Bethesda. Boom, Jesus feeds 5,000. Boom, Jesus walks on water. Boom, Jesus does something else. Boom, Jesus raises Lazarus from the dead. These are explosions of God's glory. It's cool. We're supposed to see the glory of God, but you know, all the way through, right? All the way through John. You know when you go to a firework display and they're just doing little ones? Oh, yeah, come on. You, you always save your biggest and your best one to last, don't you? No one, you, if you do not, you never get, you've got your firework display, you never get like, oh, let's do the big one first. Because <laughs> there's no point. You, the big ones always last. In John's Gospel, it's just like that. You get this sense that there's the big one coming. And all the way through John's Gospel, I haven't got time to show you now. You can look at it sometime. Read through John. It's so cool. Jesus says, no, not yet. My time's not come yet. It's not time for the big one. I'll turn water into wine, but it's not time for the big one. Not yet. Not yet. Wait. My time has not yet come. My time has not yet come. My time has not yet come. My time has not yet come until one night he prays and he says to his father, now is the time, father. Now's the time for the real glory moment. And do you know what happens the next day? He's nailed to a wooden cross and he dies. And it is inescapable in John that that is the big one. That is the great moment of glory when Jesus dies on a cross. Because it's followed by his great resurrection from the dead. So do you... Listen, I I find this... I so want to convey this to you tonight. Do you want to see the glory of God? If you go away from Contagious this week, imagine you went away saying, this week I have seen the glory of God in a way like I've never seen it before. I've seen his majesty. I've stood at his feet and just felt small and seen how big he is. Do you want that? Do you want to see it for yourself? Do you want to see it more? See more of the glory of God? That is what we're about at Contagious. And I invite you this week. It, it's gonna t- we, we've got to listen. We've got to work. We've got to look at this stuff. But you will see the glory of God as we look at Jesus together. We want to be taken up by his beauty and his majesty. We want to see God on display. So let's get into this story. So it was a long introduction, but let's get back to John 11. I now want to take you through this story, and I just want to show you how they experience God's glory. It's going to surprise you. Let's get into this story, and um, I've got three things I want to show you about seeing the glory of God. If you want to see the glory of God, here's the first thing. It means facing your weakness. It means facing your weakness. So Jesus is with his friends. Go back right to the start of chapter 11. And uh, we're told about this man named Lazarus, who's sick. He's from Bethany, the village of Mary and his sister Martha. Um, Now these are Jesus' friends. Jesus gets a message from them. So what does he do? The most obvious thing in the world, what any good friend would do, anyone who truly loved their friends would drop everything and dash to Lazarus' side. So let's read it. Uh, Verse 2, this Mary, whose brother Lazarus lay sick, was the same one who'd poured perfume on the Lord and wiped his feet with her hair. So the sister sent word to Jesus, Lord, the one you love is sick. When he heard this, Jesus said, this sickness will not end in death. No, it's for God's glory, so that God's son may be glorified through it. Jesus loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus. Yet, when he heard that Lazarus was sick, he stayed where he was two days. Jesus hears that Lazarus is sick. He loves them, and yet he doesn't go. In fact, in some, in some of your Bibles, some translations, it's stronger than just, yet he doesn't go. It actually says, he loved him, and so he didn't go. Because Jesus loved Lazarus and Mary and Martha, he didn't go for two days. Does that strike you as strange? Isn't that weird? Jesus, let's put it as bluntly as I can. Jesus loved Lazarus, so he let him die. (laughs) 
That seems weird. How, how can he do that? It is because Jesus knows that what Lazarus and Mary and Martha and his disciples, the best thing for them is to see the glory of God. And to see the glory of God is the most loving thing he can do for them. And so he lets Lazarus die. Now hear this clearly, okay? Because now it sounds like, hang on a second, you're telling me Jesus lets his mate die so he can show off how strong he is. What kind of a mate is that? No, 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 no. Jesus lets Lazarus die, not so that he can just show off. He lets him die because he loves Lazarus. And because he wants Lazarus to see, and he wants Mary and Martha and his disciples to see the glory of God. Right, here's our problem. How do you know that God loves you? We usually measure God's love for us by how well things are going in our life. Now, this is, this is really easy, okay? So, I've come back from a two-week holiday, all right? And uh, someone said to me, how was your holiday? And I said, God was really kind. We had two weeks of sunshine. Now, do you see what I've done? I've equated God's kindness. I said, God is kind because he did this for me. Now, supposing I'd had two weeks of rain, would it have been... God is kind because he gave me two weeks of rain. No, we don't think like that. We measure love. We think when things are going well for me, that's a sign that God loves me. And when things go wrong in your life, you think God doesn't love you. When things go wrong, when things happen, when bad things happen, the automatic reaction is, it's all gone wrong, God doesn't love me. Jesus loved Lazarus and he let him die. You see that? In order for them to truly see his glory, they need to see how utterly powerless they are. They have to feel their weakness. And it's not that Jesus goes, oh, excellent, let's let Lazarus die. Ha, ha, ha. It is that Jesus knows that the very best thing for Lazarus is for him to come face to face with his absolute powerlessness so that he can see the absolute glory of Jesus. Is it ever loving to let someone experience pain? If a bloke attacks my wife with a knife, am I supposed to stand there and do nothing? No. If the bloke is a heart surgeon who is performing surgery that my wife needs to save her, then it is loving to allow the pain. There are times... When God allows and uses pain to bring us face to face with our weakness in order that we might see his glory. Now that is tough. I realize that. That is tough for us to understand. But if we refuse to face up to our weakness, then we'll never come face to face with the glory of God. You see, we're so busy about our glory. Look how strong I am. I'm not weak. Look how strong I am. Look how glorious I am. Look how clever I am. Look at my GCSE grades and my five-meter swimming badge and all the things that I've done. Look how brilliant I am. You're never going to see the glory of God if you think you're strong. You have to face your weakness. That's why Jesus let Lazarus die. That is why God brings painful things into our life because they help us to feel our weakness and to see his glory more clearly. It is his love. I know it doesn't feel like it. And I know it hurts like hell. And I know that it's painful. But it is his love. Jesus loved Lazarus and he let him die. We live in a culture where we hide our weakness. Where we pretend we're not weak. I went to a school assembly last last week, uh, three weeks ago. And the kids sang a song. And it, it, it really broke my heart, the song they sang. Now I'm going to, I want to um, show it to you. In fact, I'm going to, just for a bit of light relief, <laughs> I'm going to sing it to you as an eight-year-old might sing a song. The words will appear on the screen. See if you can see why I hated this. 
quite beautiful and moving in some ways. Try not to cry. It was more beautiful when they sang it because they had, they had some music that went with it. <laughs> Is it not working? Yes, please. Sorry, I, I, sorry. I'm going to start in just a moment. I'm building myself up for my great... <laughs> I feel a power growing in my soul. There is something I can sense deep within a dream to guide me. And I know that I am reaching for my goal. I can do anything at all. I can climb the high mountain. I can hear the ocean calling vast and free. I can be anything I want with this dream inside to guide me. Just if I, if I can believe in me. There's more. With it hurts, we are dark and grey. Still know the sun is shining. Don't be wrong. And as long as I believe, there is nothing I can't wish for. Not a dream that I'm unable to fulfill. Feel free to join in. I can do anything I want I can climb the highest mountain I can hear the ocean calling fast and free It's moving, isn't it? I told you it's moving I can be anything I want With this dream on the side to guide me If I can just believe Now, I'll tell you what, right? These little kids, they sang it, they sang it so beautifully, they sang it so beautifully, their little heart, their little voice, their little faces were so beaming. I looked around at the end of the song, the parents were sobbing. I mean, like, literally, they were crying, and this is so beautiful, this is so beautiful, this is so moving. But do you know what? I was, I was gutted. Think about that song. Is that really true? I looked at these little kids, these little 10 year olds with their faces so full of hope and joy, and I looked at them and thought, this is, this is a lie. This is a lie. I looked at them and thought, how many of these kids who are so full of hope and optimism being fed this nonsense, how many kids in just a few years will be harming themselves? How many kids will have eating disorders? How many kids will be in abusive relationships? Some of these children will end up in prison. Some of these children will end up in rubbish jobs where they hate their lives. It's not true. And I tell you what, I was, I, I was, when I was looking at this, I searched for that song on, um, on YouTube, and there's a, a clip, and, and there's a clip from a school s- choir singing this, and there's a little girl in a wheelchair singing this, singing, I can climb the highest mountain. You think, why can't people see? This isn't true. This is empty nonsense. And here is Jesus saying, I'm not going to feed you a pack of lies. I want you to know how weak you are. I want you to know that on your own you are deeply, deeply broken. What about the boy who wants to play in the premiership? But it's too slow. He's going to be crushed and he's going to be devastated. What about the girl who wants to be a model, but she's too big? Do you 
see. And if you fail, if you fail to be a premiership footballer, if you fail to be a model, whose fault is it? It's yours because you didn't believe. You didn't believe in you. If you'd only believed in you, you could have done it. I had to sit my kid down afterwards and explain to him what a pack of lies that was. You see? And yet, all the parents, they're going, this is, I love it, this is wonderful. Jesus loves you too much to fill you with that nonsense. Jesus loves you too much to tell you that there's nothing wrong and you're all wonderful and there's no problem. Jesus loves you too much. He loves Lazarus too much. He doesn't come to Mary and Martha and say, hey Mary, come on, you can do anything at all. You can climb the highest mountain, you can raise your brother from the dead. Now you might not like this, But the reality is that Jesus loves you so much that he might bring you to points in your life where you feel your weakness so strongly. And he brings you there because he loves you. Because he wants you to see his glory. And I tell you what, on that day when you feel absolutely broken and when you feel you're in the worst place and when you question whether Jesus loves you, I pray that you will remember this. And that you will lift your eyes to see the glory of Jesus in the midst of your weakness. Jesus lets Lazarus die. This week we're going to learn things that we find hard. You're going to find things hard this week. They're going to make you feel small. Didn't you feel a bit beaten up by the seminar this morning? You're dead. I'm dead. Okay, all right, fine, I get it. You're still dead. I know, I know, I got it. You're blind. Okay, I'm deaf. Yeah, all right. We're going to learn things. And there's going to be part of us that goes, no, no, no. I can be anything I want. I can climb the highest mountain. And we have to let Jesus speak truth to us. We may well feel like getting angry. But we want to see the glory of God. But after these two days, Jesus then goes. And uh, the obvious question that he faces when he gets there is, where were you, Jesus? Why didn't you come? Three times he's asked, why didn't you come, Jesus? Where were you? First up's Martha. Here she comes, look. She comes out, uh, let's, um, verse 17. Let's pick up the story. On his arrival, Jesus found that Lazarus had already been in the tomb for four days. And as all these people come to comfort, and we're told that Martha comes out. Verse 21. Lord, Martha said to Jesus, if you'd been here, my brother would not have died. But I know that even now God will give you whatever you ask. Okay, here's my second big point, okay? Everyone all right? Wait, let's get this right. First big point, you need to face, face your weakness. Here's the second big point. I'm going to tell you it. It's not going to make any sense to you, and I'll explain it to you. But you can write it down, so you got it. Here's your second point. Place your pin carefully. That's my second point. Place your pin, pin, carefully. Let me explain what I mean. You play Pin Town Donkey? That's a stupid game, isn't it? I mean, what's the point of that? What is the point of Pin the Tail on the Donkey? I mean, who, who first thought, I know, let's get a donkey without a tail, a picture, and we'll all pin a donkey and lay a tail on it? That's mad, isn't it? Unless you did it with a real donkey. Because then it would be like more extreme. Because if you're blindfolded, you, you might be going for his head or for his bum, and it might kick you. Sorry. Yes, pin. Uh, actually, it was invented in the 1800s by a man called Mr. Zimmerman. <laughs> anyway. Um, here's my point, right? Martha has her... Ho- it's like she's got her hope. Where she pinned her hope? Look at what she says. Let's have a look. And let's see where Martha's pinned her hope, okay? Jesus says to her, verse 23, your brother will rise again. Martha says, I know he will rise again in the resurrection at the last day. How do you think she said that? I know he will rise again in the resurrection at the last day. How do you think she said that? Do you think she said, I know that he will rise again in the resurrection at the last day. My guess is there was a bit of a sigh. It's like... I know that he'll rise again in the resurrection last day. 
Martha's got this hope. She's got this hope that Lazarus will rise again one day. She's got this hope in the resurrection that there's a day coming when God will raise the dead and there'll be life forever. She knows she's got her hope and she's like, she's got her hope and she's got it pinned. She's got it pinned over here somewhere on the last day. And she just, you know, she knows that. And Jesus says, your brother's going to rise again. She goes, oh, I know, on the last day. It's a long way off. Look what Jesus does. What Jesus does in verse 25 is just, is, is, is staggering. Jesus says, I am the resurrection and the life. It's like this. Jesus takes Martha by the hand and says, Martha, can we go and get your pin? Come over here. I'm going to go and get your pin. He goes and gets her pin. Says, right, we'll take your pin from there. Come back over here. I've got your pin. You need to repin your pin. Jesus says, pin your hope on me. I am the resurrection and life. Jesus says, this future abstract kind of hope that you have, that is a hope, Jesus says, that's me. It doesn't have to be a future, cross your fingers, hope to die, hope not to die, hope the future thing, a hope. Jesus says, it's about me. It's all about me. Pin your hope on me. I am am the resurrection life. He who believes in me will live even though he dies. And who, even, even though he lives. And whoever lives and believes in me will never die. Do you believe this? Me, 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 me. Jesus turns up at this funeral. He walks up to this death place and he says, me. Now if he's just a man, that is the most horrible, arrogant, disgusting way to behave. But he's not. He's the eternal son of God. He is the one who can say, I am the one who has power. I'm the resurrection and the life. I'm the one who's come to bring hope into this world. We live in this world of death and sin and decay. And Jesus says, pin your hope in me. And if you just think for a, ma- for a minute, if you take the, the pin out of your pocket, because you've got a pin in your pocket, you, have so- you are placing your pin somewhere. You are placing your hope somewhere. In this world of death and decay, you are putting your hope in something. And I want you to think for a second, what is it that you think will save you? What is it that you've placed your hope in? Where have you pinned your hope? Because you want resurrection. Everyone wants resurrection. Everyone wants a better life. But some people get their pin, and every week, they pay a pound. And they pick six numbers. And they place their pin in the national lottery. And they say, let's hope. I'm going to place my pin there. Because you know what happens if you win the National Lottery? You get resurrection. You get to leave behind the old way of life and you get a new life. Right? Some people pin their hope in Simon Cowell. (laughs) I mean, there's good reasons to place pins in them, but not your pin of hope. (laughs) Some people place their pins of hope in... Someone like Simon Cowell saying, I'm going to queue up for hours, I'm going to sing, I'm going to sing, I'm going to be a star, he's going to love me. Why else do people humiliate themselves on X Factor? People who plainly can't sing. Go on and go, Living in the Vida Loca, inside, outside, yeah, living in the Vida Loca. <laughs> and they place, they've got their pin and they're sticking it right there in Simon Cowell's face. And he takes their pin and he just spits it out. Why do they want? Why? Because Simon Cowell has the power, people think, to give them resurrection. I used to stack shelves in Asda, but now look at me! It's resurrection! I've left behind my stupid old way of life, but look at me now! Now most of you are far too sensible to pin your hope in the lottery and Simon Cowell. Some of you are pinning your hope on your exam results, aren't you? Some of you think that on Thursday... 
That's your hope. That's what's going to make your life better. If you can just get those grades. If you can just get those grades. If you can just get those grades and get into university. If you can just get into university, you can get that job and you can leave behind this rubbish life and you have this wonderful life. Is that what you can your hope? For some of you, you've got no chance on, on the uh, exam thing. You know, you know that. <laughs> Let's just be blunt. It's not happening, is it? You, you, you've chucked those pins away a long time ago. <laughs> like, Exam pins, no hope there. But don't worry, because there's plenty of other pins, aren't there? Just think, if you could find that perfect boyfriend, he would change my life, wouldn't he? He'd make my life meaningful. He'd take my sad brokenness, and I'm going to pin my hope, I'm going to pin it in this... I'm not going to pin it literally in him, because that's never going to work as a chat-up line, you know. Hi, mate! <laughs> Don't do that. But you're pinning your hope in some relationship that you think this is what's going to save me. What is it? Where are you pinning your hope? Because Jesus wants to gather those pins together and he says, you know what? The National Lottery cannot give you resurrection. Simon Cowell cannot give you resurrection. He cannot save you from the brokenness and the death of this life. A boyfriend straight A's. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter what you're pinning your hope in. It cannot save you. Jesus says, I, I am the resurrection. I'm the life. I'm the only one. I'm the only one who can take you from death to life. Will you pin your hope in him? That's what Jesus is saying. And if you want to see the glory of God, you have to pin your hope on Jesus because you pin your hope anywhere else and you will not see the glory of God. But there's one final thing, and uh, I realise that we, uh, we've been going for a while, so stick with it, okay? Are we all all right? Everyone happy? Alive? No, you're dead. Come on. I oh, know you're alive. <laughs> Third thing, right? So you've got to face your weakness. You've got to pin, place your pin carefully. That's the second thing. Third thing, right? You have to believe in the death smasher. And I love this, right? Jesus walks right up to death and faces it down. Believe in the death smasher. Sorry, did I not say that clearly? That's the third point. Believe, but et le. Believe in the death smasher. Let's look what happens next, right? So Jesus, he's a little bit out of town. He's on his way, but Martha stopped him on the way. Now look, he walks right up to death. You know, um, like in my daydreams, right? Not in reality, but in my daydreams. I have this daydream where like someone really, really strong walks in and threatens you all with a gun and is going to shoot you all. And I walk right up to him, right up to his face. And I just face him down and he, he leaves. <laughs> <laughs> that may be more information than you needed to know about my mind. <laughs> that is what Jesus does with death, right? Jesus walks right up to death. He walks right up in its face. He gets in its face and you watch who backs down. Have a look, right? Jesus walked closer and closer to death. So he's walking. Um, after, so pick up at verse 28. After she'd said this, she went back and called her sister Mary aside. The teacher is here, she said, and is asking for you. When Mary heard this, she got up quickly and went to him. Jesus had not yet entered the village. He's on his way. He's not quite got there yet. He keeps getting stopped. But, while he was, uh, but was still at the place where Martha had met him. When the Jews who was Mary in the house, comforting her, noticed how quickly she got up and went out. They followed her, supposing she was going to the tomb to mourn there. When Mary reached the place where Jesus was and saw him, she fell at his feet and said, Lord, if you'd been here, my brother would not have died the second time. When Jesus saw her weeping and the Jews who'd come along with her also weeping, he was deeply moved in spirit and troubled. Where have you laid him, he asked. Come and see, Lord, they said. Jesus wept. Then the Jews said, see how he loved him. Jesus walks right into Death Valley. Jesus walks right into the place of death. He's surrounded by the weeping. He's surrounded by the crying. He's surrounded by the pain and the agony and the anguish. And what does he do? What did we just read that he does? He cries. He cries. He's the eternal, all-powerful, extraordinary son of God, and he's standing there, and tears are falling down his face. 
as he encounters death. As he sees what death has done to this world. He loves life. He loves this world. God so loves this world. But when Jesus sees death face to face, he weeps tears. But they're not just tears of, oh no, sad. They're tears of anger. He is angry. He's deeply moved. The, the, the word there is like, it's like he snorts like a horse that's angry in the face of death. How dare you do this to my world, death? And he cries. And I want you to know this, guys. When you're in that place of pain, perhaps the place of pain that God has brought you to to show your weakness, Jesus weeps with you in that place. He has experienced that pain. He knows this is not some Jesus sits there going, oh, stop crying. It's all right, I'm here. He's with us in that pain. But still he goes closer. Look, he goes closer to death. Look, look, look. Uh, Verse 37, some of them said, could not he who opened the eyes of the blind man have kept this man from dying? Jesus once more deeply moved, came to the tomb. See the drama? He's right up. He's really close now. A stone was laid across the entrance. Come on, Jesus, you've got close enough. Don't get any closer. Look what Jesus says. Take away the stone. (gasps) And Martha says, no, 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 because it's going to stink. He's been dead four days. There'll be the smell of death. Jesus says, move it away. You are going to see the glory of God. (laughs) So excited. Jesus, right up in death's face. The stone is rolled away. Jesus looks to heaven and he prays. He prays a prayer so that people know this is about the glory of God. Heavenly Father, I know that you hear me. You almost hear me. I'm praying this so that all these people will believe that you've sent me. And then comes the moment of confrontation when Jesus stares death in the face and says, Lazarus, come out. And look, just imagine you're standing there. You'd be like, he's mad. And then as you listen, you can hear something inside the tomb. It would be so freaky, wouldn't it? It would be so freaky. Is that a noise? There's something in there and suddenly this man comes the dead man I love the way John writes it do you see it the dead man came out (laughs) oh it's the dead man still wrapped in all the bandages and she says take off the clothes of death let him go do you see the power of Jesus you have to believe that Jesus can smash death And if that is extraordinary, then in just a few chapters' time in John's Gospel, Jesus walks right up to death's face again. And this time goes even closer. As he walks the road of spitting, and he walks the road of hatred, as people punch him and whip him and mock him and spit on him, as he's covered with blood and saliva and disgusting stuff, and yet still he walks, he walks right up to death. And he stares death in the face. And then he hangs, dying on a cross, dying a death that he doesn't deserve, dying the death that's my death, the death that I deserve, taking upon himself my sin. He hangs there, he faces death right in the face. And he dies. The eternal Son of God died. He was placed in a tomb, and a stone was rolled until three days later the stone was rolled away and he was alive he was alive he's the death smashing king and if you are going to see the glory of God you have to believe in this king you have to believe that he faced death in your place he faced death for you he stood in the place of death for you so that he could defeat death For you, so that if you believe in him, you will never die. Even though you're going to die, you'll never die. This body you see here, it's getting old. It's dying, even as you watch. I'm dying. Right now, I'm dying. 
And one day this body will die, but Jesus is the power. He has defeated death, and he raised this body from the... This is another story. He's going to raise this body from death and give life forevermore. Now look, we need to finish. To see the glory of God, we need to face our weakness. We need to place our pin carefully in Jesus, and we need to believe in the death-smashing king. Have you seen the glory of God? And perhaps tonight, a great prayer would be to say, Jesus, please show me this glory. I want to see it. I don't just want to know about it. I want to see it. And I invite you to pray that. We're going to pray together now. And I wonder if you'd be willing to pray what Moses prayed. Lord, show me your glory. I want to see the glory of Jesus in a way that makes me feel small and helps me to see how big he is. Let's pray together. Just take a moment, take a moment in your heart to say something to God. Whether you believe in him or not. If you don't believe in him, say, if you're there, show me your glory. If you do believe in him, why not ask him to give you a glimpse, a greater glimpse of glory that would change you and humble you and transform you. Take a moment to say something, then I'm going to pray and then we'll sing. Heavenly Father, we, we pray those words that Moses prayed, prayed. Show us your glory. We want to see your glory in Jesus. Lord, we want to feel our own weakness. Please help us to be honest about our own weakness, to be honest about the fact we cannot save ourselves. Help us to pin all our hope on Jesus, to pin everything on him. And help us to believe in his death-smashing power. That even though one day our bodies will die, he has defeated death. And he has given us life that will never die. Our Father, help us to trust. Help us to put all our hope in Jesus, we pray. Amen. We're going to finish by singing a fantastic song that talks about the future when